Well, greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Michael Morelli, and I am the Assistant Dean and Assistant Professor of Theology, Culture, and Ethics at Northwest Seminary, a member of Axe Seminaries of Trinity Western University. I'm very pleased to be your host and moderator for this theology symposium, which is co-sponsored by Axe Seminaries and the John H. Pickford Chair of Theology at Northwest Seminary. Before we begin our program for the evening, we wanted to create space for one announcement and time for prayer. So first the announcement, we'd actually like to invite you to attend our Spring Theology Symposium, which is tentatively scheduled for February 16th, 2022. Uh, Dr. Archie Spencer, who is responding this evening, has kindly invited me to present a paper titled Post-War Prophets for a Technologized World, Jacques Lou Paul Verlio and the Witness of Their Work for Theology and Ethics Today. Uh, formal announcements will be coming closer to the day of that event, but uh, do pencil this in your calendars if you would like to attend and we, warm, we welcome you to do so. And second, we thought it would be uh, appropriate and to take some time to pray for the people and land being affected right now by some significantly damaging um, events. And so uh, I would like to start by reading a little bit from Psalm uh, 69 verses one through three. And then if you would join me um, in, in, in praying, uh, that, would be, that would be welcome, thanks. Save us, O God, for the waters have come up to our neck. We sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. We have come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over us. We are weary with crying out. Our throat is parched, our eyes grow dim with waiting for our God. Good and gracious Father, we are grateful that you are not a God who is distant and inactive, that you are a God who is close and at work at all times, in all places, even times and places such as the ones we find ourselves in today. As we are inspired and guided by your Holy Spirit to pray, we ask that all of us here and all of the people who are not here would have a broad, deep and strong sense of your presence, work and care for us and for everything you have created, including the land that is submerged in and battered by water right now. We pray for safety in the midst of danger. We pray for repair in the midst of damage. We pray for peace in the midst of chaos. We pray for hope in the midst of uncertainty. And we pray for all the people affected by these and other troubling events that reveal, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Romans 8, verse 22, the whole creation has been groaning. Please, Lord, show us your safety, your repair, your peace, your hope, and your rescue today and in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first, allow me to introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Dr. Young Wa Ge. Dr. Ge is the director of the Mandarin program and assistant professor of theology at Trinity Western Seminary, a member of Axe Seminaries of Trinity Western University. With a PhD in Christian theology and philosophy of religion from the University of Cambridge, he did postdoctoral work and research in Jesus College, Cambridge, and Regent College before coming to Trinity Western. He has published in leading journals such as the Haythrop Journal, Philosophy East and West, Tyndale Bulletin, Sino-Christian Studies, and Logos and Numa. He is also the author of the recently published The Many and the One, Creation is Participation in Augustine and Aquinas, which he will be presenting on tonight with a paper titled The Many and the One, Modern Secularity and Classical Christian Theology. And second, allow me to introduce our respondent for the evening, Dr. Archie Spencer. Dr. Archie Spencer is Professor of Theology and the J.H. Pickford Distinguished Chair of Theology at Northwest Seminary, also a member of Act Seminaries at Trinity Western. As the author of notable books like Clearing a Space for Human Action, Ethical Ontology and the Theology of Karl Barth, and The Analogy of Faith, The Quest for God's Speakability, he has developed an international reputation as a scholar, speaker, and theologian, including Catholic circles where he's developed an ecumenical dialogue with the lay movement 
Communion and Liberation, and the Italian theologian Luigi Giussani. His ministry and professional experience also includes serving as a pastor in various settings within Pentecostal and Baptist contexts for over 15 years. And so with that, I turn the proverbial microphone over to Dr. Ge. And following his presentation, Dr. Spencer will provide a response. And then once a response has uh, been made to Dr. Spencer's uh, comments, we will use the remainder of our time to discuss any questions or comments that uh, you may have. And so with that, uh, Dr. Young Wong Ke, you can share what you've brought to share with us today. Oh, well, thank you so much, Michael, uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you so much, my friend Archie, for uh, hosting this event. Uh, many thanks to uh, the seminaries and the Northwest uh, Seminary uh, for having uh, this event and giving me the opportunity to present uh, the paper today. Um, I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint uh, right now. Uh, let me just uh, uh, start by saying that this lecture is pretty much based on the book that I uh, recently published. And uh, so I wish I had, I had more time to talk more about the book, but I have a very limited time. So I'm going to only talk about uh, the pretty much the uh, introduction and, uh, and then the conclusion. So I will skip the, the main body. Um, so the name uh, I chose for the lecture is uh, The Many, the One, and Modern Secularity and Classical Christian Theology. Uh, which reflects uh, pretty much uh, the book uh, that I have in my hand. So uh, it's, it's going to be based on this book. Like, let me uh, show a, a brief picture of this uh, book um, here. So this is the book uh, that, uh, that came out uh, this May uh, by Lexing Books. It's, uh, it's, it's based on a, pre uh, a revised edition of my PhD thesis. It took me a long time to uh, get it finally published. So, so today I'm going to uh, kind of give a summary of uh, what this book about, and with basically the introduction and the conclusion, and uh, and uh, we have some discussion from there. So I'm going to start with this book from. Uh, let me start from this. It's not really working for, uh, very well for some reason. Okay. All right. The first part of my lecture would be uh, modern secularity and theological analysis. Uh, Diagnosis. As we know, God's truth is eternal, but theology is always in the process of development because theology, as it is, must respond to the challenges and problems of a specific time and context. As I understand it, the single most fundamental challenge to modern Western Christianity is per perhaps the problem of secularism, to which Many contemporary theological and philosophical reflection has been devoted. Uh, for instance, in his landmark uh, study, A Secular Age, uh, Canadian Christian philosopher Charles Taylor asks this question, you know, what happened after the uh, Reformation? Uh, so what happened in the 500 years since the time of Reformation where uh, it was difficult to people to think that God might not exist? And to now, where it seems to be more difficult to, to accept that God exists. So what made the shift happen? What really happened to the 500 years in the Western world? It is indeed a profound question. Another example of uh, such a fracking is, is found in the uh, late British theologian Colin Gunton's book uh, named The One of Three and the Many, God, Creation, and the Culture of Modern Modernity. Uh, in this book, uh, he uses the phrase, uh, the one and the many. As a matter of fact, the one and many really names one of the most ancient problems in philosophy. It really asks the question whether reality is ultimately one or uh, plurality, and if they're both, and how these two relate to each other. For most people today, this kind of question seems too archaic to, be any, to have any relevance. However, in his uh, Bampton lectures at Oxford University in, in uh, 1992, Gunton uh, uses this uh, scheme of the one and many to try to provide uh, a theological diagnosis 
uh, into the problem of the modernity, which he sees as excessive secularism and uh, fragmentation. Gunton argues that at the heart of the modern secular secularity is really a, a tension between the many and the one. Uh, for him, the dominant mode of Western thought has tended to prioritize unity over plurality, and modernity is an era in which the many revolts against the one. Unfortunately, because the traditional concept of God has been associated with the, the oppressive one, the Christian God in the nowadays in the modern concept uh, context is rejected as a source of unity in the modern life, which he believes is really at the root of modern secularism. So in, in, in response to this uh, problem of modern secularity, I would argue probably that one of the most significant de recent developments in Christian theology is uh, the radical orthodox movement, uh, which appropriates the platonic idea of participation as a fundamental tool for critiquing and find solutions uh, to the problem of modernity. So for radical orthodoxy, you probably have seen uh, the pictures of these um, people. Uh, they're pretty much all from Cambridge. They had a, uh, somehow the Cambridge uh, background connection. So um, uh, the, the one uh, on the left is um, um, John Milbank. Uh, the lead in the middle is uh, Catherine Pickstock. And uh, the final one is uh, 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 Keith Graham. So, um, so for them, for radical orthodox authors, um, the heart of the problem of modernity, uh, the, the, the pervasive secularism and the exclusion of Christianity from the public life is really uh, a distorted, deeply distorted view of God's relation to the world. They argue that the assumption, the universal assumption of the modernity is that with the help of reason, life and society can go on and can function without recourse to God and therefore become increasingly autonomous and secularized. But they argue, however, without being grounded in God, a quote, the world is so flattened that all we have is imminent, end of quote. And quote, the imminent in implodes upon itself, end of quote, which ultimately leads to nihilism. So to counter nihilism, they argue, we need a participatory ontology that refuses any territory independent of God, and that insists that all of creation depends on God. So for radical orthodoxy, participatory ontology is the antidote to the crisis of modernity. So while radical orthodoxy turns the concept of uh, participation into an influential theme in the British economy, Hans Bersma is uh, doing the similar things uh, in the North American context. Uh, so this is our friend and our colleague, uh, Hans Bersma. Many of you uh, know him. Uh, so like radical orthodoxy, Hans Bersma is deeply concerned about the excessive secularism and fragmentation of the modern life. And he's convinced that participatory ontology is the only way out of the modern predicaments. Uh, so here's the book um, that came out uh, about 10 years ago named Heavenly Participation, the Weaving of a Sacramental Tapestry. So in this book, Hans Bersma locates the root of the problem of the modernity in this, in this worldliness, by which he means that uh, bodily, here's a quote, bodily goods, culture endeavors, and political achievements have become matters of ultimate faith, uh, ultimate concern, end quote. Such exclusive focus on here and now is a result of moving away from the pre-modern participatory view of reality which he argues uh, emphasized that temporary goods have meaning only because they participate in and point toward the eternal goodness of God. So accordingly, Hans Bersma's uh, proposed solution to the problem is to restore or retrieve uh, this particular ontology in the pre-modern uh, Platonist think, uh, Christian synthesis. So what do they really mean by uh, participation? Another question is, is it really legitimate to use a platonic idea or concept as a foundation for Christian theology? So with these questions in mind, we'll look at uh, radical orthodoxy and uh, Ber Hans Bersma's concepts of uh, participation more closely. 
So first, let's look at uh, radical orthodox understanding of participation. So in their manifesto, radical orthodoxy and new theology, uh, the leaders of the movement claim that the central theologic framework of radical orthodoxy is participation, as developed by Plato and reworked by Christianity, because any alternative configuration reserves an uh, interior independent of God. The latter can only lead to nihilism. Although participation is fundamental to the project, uh, it is kind of difficult to find a constant constant discussion on the concept and the meaning of participation as such in their writings. But uh, what we can know from uh, their writing is that uh, from, their, from their perspective, the, uh, the ontological framework of modern secular uh, world is grounded, uh, quote, in the universal being that grants autonomy to things, such, as, uh, such, as, such that it is supposed the world can be understood in itself, that is, without reference to its transcendent uh, origin, the creator, end of quote. Uh, so they're very critical of Don Scotus, uh, and especially in his teaching of uh, the university of being. They argue uh, it is the, the university of being is ontology of imminence. It replaces the traditional uh, doctrine of analogy of being, which maintains that God's being differs fundamentally from that of creature. Uh, Don Scotus claimed that to be can be predicated of God and, and of creature in the same way. As such, they argue, being became an abstract, a neutral category that is separable from God, and that creation therefore became flattened, devoid of any theological depth. So Pixock argues, quote, the Scotist university separates the creation from God, end of quote. That produces autonomous realms independent of God, which she believes is at the really at the root of modern secularism. So as we have seen, the radical orthodox complaint uh, about the Scotus university being is that the university being really cuts off creatures linked to God and therefore turns the world into a purely imminent realm without any transcendent uh, anchor. In contrast, they argue, the, the traditional idea of Participation emphasized that the emphasized the creation's connectedness to God and also its transcendent dimension. So for them, uh, participate ontology maintains that the world is anchored in God and can only be understood in the light of its uh, relation to its transcendent origin. So radical orthodoxy uh, described the concept of participation as a suspension of material, since only the transcendence which suspends things in the sense of its interruption them suspends them also in the other sense of up, upholding the relative worth over against uh, the void, at the end of quote. So although ontologies of eminence seek to protect the integrity of, quote, language, knowledge, the body, is that experience, uh, political community, friendship, etc., end of quote, by separating them from God, such ontologies only end up making this worldliness, this worldliness dissolve. Their conclusion is that imminent materialism results in the destruction of the matter. Uh, here's the quote um, from the book. By contrast, the theological perspective of participation actually saves appearances by exceeding them, hence by appealing to an, an internal source where bodies, art, language, sexual and political union, one is not uh, taking leave of their density. On the contrary, one is existing that behind this density resides even greater density, beyond all contrast of density and lightness, as beyond all contrast definition of li limitness. This is to say that there is only there is only because there is more than it is. So therefore, according to radical orthodoxy, by grounding the material world in its a transcendent origin, participant ontology does not compromise the integrity of the world, but in fact, it secures its goodness. Far from denigrating matter, they argue, participant ontology at its roots really affirms the goodness of matter and creation. Transcendence by no means destroys imminence. On the contrary, only transcendence, they argue, quote, only transcendence can make imminence as such. So therefore, uh, from, 
So therefore, for the uh, radical orthodox perspective, uh, the central aspects of uh, the concept of preservation really include the following. Uh, first, the world or the creation's uh, close connection with God. And secondly, transcendence. And thirdly, the goodness of material creation. Next, we're going to move on to uh, Burzma and his concept of participation. So, um, like radical orthodoxy, Burzma laments that modernity is an era in which theology is trivialized and marginalized because earthly things instead of God have become exclusive focus of a modern, modern life. Obsession with the created goods, however, he argues, does not encourage people to respect the value of creation, but a foster, a quote, a denigration and modific, uh, commodification of the created order, the end of quote. He argues that when the world is cut off from God, it becomes fragmentary and shifts adrift, quote, on the flux of nihilistic waves, end of quote. So for him, the solution to the crisis is really to return a sacramental ontology or uh, participant ontology as he uses interchangeably, which he believes, quote, is the, the broader consensus of the, of the church fathers and the medieval theologian or the great tradition as he calls it. So then, uh, in order to explain the concept of participation, Burzma uh, first explains uh, the idea of mystery. He argues, until late uh, mid ages, people look at the reality, the whole world as a mystery. Uh, here's a quote from him. Mystery refer to the realities behind uh, the appearances that one could uh, observe by means of senses. That is to say, through our hands, eyes, uh, ears, nose, and tongue, uh, are able to access reality. They cannot fully grasp this reality. They cannot comprehend it. The reason for this basic incom incomprehensibility of the universe was that the universe, as the poet uh, Jared Manley Hop Hopkins famous put it, uh, is charged with the grandeur of God. So even the most basic created realities that we observe as human beings carry an extra dimension, as it were, end of quote. Uh, so this is the uh, his exposition of the idea of mystery. Next, he uh, he wants to explain the idea of sacrament. Uh, so he com he compares the idea of sacrament with the idea of symbol. Uh, he argues that uh, both a symbol and reality point something else. Uh, the difference between uh, the two is that while the reality that a symbol points toward is external to the symbol. The reality that sacrament points toward is really present or imminent in the sacrament. So in the sense, sacrament uh, really captures both the transcendence and the imminence of the reality that it reflects. For this reason, Burzma argues the idea of sacrament or participation was exclusively used in the traditional uh, Christian theology to describe the creation's relation to God. Uh, here's a quote. The reason for this mysterious character of the, of the world on the understanding of the great tradition, at least, is that it participates in some greater reality from which it derives its being and its value, end of quote. So for Burzma, uh, sacramental ontology or uh, participant ontology are pretty much interchangeable. So according to Burzma, at the heart of the participant ontology is the emphasis that God is really uh, present in the world and that the world is not autonomous, but points toward God. And he believes that is the consensus of the great tradition, uh, which maintains a balance between affirming the goodness of creation on the one hand and avoiding the idolatry of making created goods our own ultimate concern on the other. So this balance, he argues, however, was disrupted by historical developments such as the universal being and nominalism in the late Middle Ages. Like radical orthodoxy, Burzma blames Scotus for turning being into a neutral category that both creatures and God share. The universal being not only undermines the transcendence of God, but turned the created order into an independent domain uh, from God. Likewise, he argues, nominalism, by rejecting universals, cut the link between the natural and the supernatural. Together, these ideas pave the way for modernity. Here's a quote. The scissors of modernity leading from monology to university and from realism to nominalism, cut the sacro sacramental tapestry into two, 
thus caused the decline and ultimately the near uh, collapse of the Platonist Christian synthesis in the modern Western world. The outcome was the desacralized culture of modernity in which the natural order had been cut from its sacramental participation in the life of God. So as Bergman sees, sees it, modernity is an era in which uh, participant ontology is abandoned, but without participation, he believes, creative things are disconnected from, from God, their transcendent source of unity and being, and they become, therefore become groundless. Uh, thus he concludes, uh, quote, the only faithful forward is really by way of sacramental ontology, or in other words, the only faithful forward is by retrieving the uh, traditional uh, theology of participation. So next, I'm going to uh, present uh, some critical uh, responses to the uh, the idea of participant ontology. Uh, so while participation has become a hugely influential topic in modern theological uh, debate, it also has attracted uh, criticism on many grounds. I'm going to skip a lot of criticism, but only focus on this this book. The most uh, substantial uh, criticism of, uh, especially radical orthodoxy's uh, version of participation are really vo voices by uh, reform theologians. Uh, so they had a, a, a kind of conference, uh, the dialogue between radical orthodoxy and uh, the reform tradition. So this collection has um, you know, a collection of essays uh, written by both, uh, from both theologians on both sides. So from the reform uh, perspective, their concern is that radical orthodox's unwarranted reliance on Platonism really contains a danger of under, undermining the goodness and the integrity of creation. Uh, so here's their, uh, their criticism. So it is, it is quite evident uh, that radical orthodox concept of participation has uh, deep uh, Platonic roots. Um, I'm going to skip that. Uh, we already know that uh, they use a lot of uh, sources from Platonism and a new Platonism. Uh, but so they argue, uh, rather than uh, denigrating the goodness of creation, uh, Plato, with its uh, uh, Platonic uh, uh, participant ontology, actually defends the goodness of the material creation. However, such a reading of Plato is called a question by uh, Reformed uh, theologians. Uh, for instance, uh, James Smith suggests that in, in many passages of the uh, Platonic uh, corpus, the body is described as evil and cont contamination from which the soul seeks uh, purification. Uh, we can find these passages in Phaedo. And therefore, the body is seen as a, as a prison from which the soul is released upon death. Likewise, in the, Re in the Republic, the philosopher king, detached from the bodies as a practice for death, a rule over the lower classes that are too attached to their body. So there is a clearly uh, a disdain of body and uh, in Platonic teaching, which is finally evident uh, in his teaching of the immor uh, immortal, despotic soul as a telos of humanity, which is really opposed uh, to the, um, the Christian doctrine of, of the body, in, uh, the resurrection. So uh, the Reformed theologians argue that these counts uh, in Plato's writing make it difficult to say that uh, for Plato, embodiment is a good thing. In addition, the reform thinkers are also wary about the fact that participation, uh, participatory ontology tends to, to deny the integrity of uh, creation. The radical orthodox authors have spoken of the creation as nothing in itself, which really gives one the impression that the creation has nothing intrinsic uh, to itself. Uh, for instance, Graham uh, Graham Ward asserts that the potential of things, quote, is not contained within the material, but in and around it, end of quote. So in response to this statement, uh, James Smith uh, writes, here's a quote. So there's a sense in which the being of things seems to be eccentric uh, to them rather than inhering in them. As a result, radical orthodox particular ontology can slide toward a, an occasionalism that requires incessant uh, activity the creator to uphold what seemed to be a deficient creation, a tendency to, to emphasize a tendency to emphasize the creation's participation in the divine to the extent that it seems the divine does everything. So he suggests that the radical orthodox emphasis on creation nothing in itself and continuous 
dependence on God seem to imply that the creator, that the creatures have no inherent realities uh, to themselves. The claim that the creation has no uh, reality intrinsic to self does seem to suggest that the creation, a creature, is not real uh, in itself. However, as we'll see uh, later in the book, uh, as I argued, that Aquinas um, argues that the creature, while participating in God's goodness, must have its own goodness, and that participation by no means abrogates uh, its integrity. However, uh, rely heavily on, uh, on Platonism. Radical Orthodox cons of participation really give us in an impression that the intrinsic goodness of creation and the integrity of creation is not, uh, it, uh, not uh, affirmed. Uh, so for this reason, while admitting that there's some kind of um, participation is needed, James Smith is, is pretty much skeptical of the uh, radical Orthodox version. So here's a quote. Uh, he said, uh, Milbank and uh, Pixar's uh, Plato scholarship has not convinced me that we need Plato for such a project, nor even that Plato offers a properly incarnational ontology of a participation. In this respect, then, I think that the uh, Reformed tradition's allergy to Platonism remains warranted. But for, just that, but for just that reason, we ought to seriously engage with the radical orthodoxy in the articulation of an in incarnational participating ontology that unpacks the goodness of creation, end of quote. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, the same concern or criticism can be applied to uh, uh, Burzma. Uh, following Augustine, uh, Burzma contains that the created goodness cannot be enjoyed for its own sake, but can only be used. Uh, it's a famous uh, quote from Augustine. So here's the quote from, uh, uh, from Burzma. Accordingly, while we may use this, this, good, this good created order, only the trying God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is to be enjoyed. The temporal uh, created order may only be used with, with an eye to the internal, eternal purpose of the enjoyment of God, the end quote. While it's understandable that uh, Hans Bersma is anxious to rebuke the idolatrous nature of modern culture, uh, his argument does give us an impression that creation has no intrinsic value or goodness to its own. And this is evident when he asserts that the recognition of the goodness of the created order is always uh, predicated on its uh, participant status, that is, that is, its goodness is um, not its own, the end quote. Uh, so he, he explicitly explains that uh, the goodness of a, crea crea a creature is not its own. So to emphasize creatures dependent on, dependence on God, uh, my sense is that a uh, person may have overreacted uh, and his rhetoric suggests that the creatures have no trans, trans, uh, intrinsic goodness to their own. But to say that the, the creation does not have their own goodness uh, does uh, tend to downplay its integrity and its uh, substantiality. Uh, so th this is uh, uh, the part of uh, the critical part of the participant ontology. So next, uh, I'm going to present the proposal, basically kind of the outline of the whole book uh, in a very uh, in, a, in a very uh, summary way. So therefore, as we can see, both radical orthodoxy and Han, uh, Hans Bertrand's accounts of participation are subject to the critique that they tend to deprive creation of its intrinsic goodness and its integrity. This vulnerability, I would argue, comes from the fact that their accounts of participation depend too heavily on Platonism. Um, and they also really underestimate the foundation of Christian teaching of the doctrine of creation. So participation ontology in its uh, platonic origin indeed contains an inherent mistrust for materiality. To become, to use this as a core concept of Christian theology, I would argue we need a more substantially Christianized or more distinctively Christian concept of creation, uh, of participation. So uh, in the process of the Christian, Christianization of participation, we will see uh, in the book that um, Augustine Aquinas played a particularly crucial role. For both theologians, uh, the idea of, uh, of creative ex nihilo uh, is central, uh, which really enables them to profoundly transform the concept of participation in the light of the doctrine of creation. So in both Augustine Aquinas, 
we'll find a more distinctly Christian concept of participation, which can avoid the weaknesses of radical orthodoxy and, and Burzma. So my argument is that events on radical orthodoxy and Burzma can therefore be made by treating, retrieving the concepts of participation uh, in classical Christian theology, uh, such as uh, we can find uh, in Gustin Aquinas. So as a way forward, um, I would argue in this book that uh, we should examine uh, how Augustine Aquinas Christianized participant ontology in the light of the doctrine of credit uh, ex nihilo. Um, uh, just a very brief uh, explanation of uh, how, how this uh, Christianization uh, took place. So at its origin, participation was a notion by, uh, employed by Plato to explain the way in which many things can warrant the same name. So participation was therefore essential a theory to account for the relation between the many and the one. In the Christian context, however, while the meaning of the participation has been transformed and used to describe the relation between, the, between God and creation, the many in one structure remains. Uh, in the Christian concept, God as the sore creator of all things is now the unified one, whereas the many refers to the created uh, plurality. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Plato does have a tendency to elevate the one over the many, and that's the problem uh, that Gunton uh, was criticizing. But I argue that in the more Christianized version of conception of, of the participation, God is no longer the oppressive one, but the one that sustains creaturely uh, plurality. So therefore, retrieval of, of participation in Augustine Aquinas will prove a crucial uh, for modern uh, theological discussion. It will help uh, contemporary theologies of participation as, as found uh, in Radical Orthodoxy and uh, Hans Berth might be anchored uh, in a more distinctly Christian and less Platonic grounds. Uh, this participant ontology, which is really a fundamental exp uh, metaphysical expression of the ex nihilo, will also prove essential for establishing a coherent uh, worldview uh, in this uh, postmodern world. Uh, so I'm going to skip, skip, skip ahead. Uh, the whole the main body of the book and just jump direct directly into the uh, uh the conclusion and also the conclusion will be very brief so we're, we're going back to the the problem of modern secularity and the christian theology um so as we we have argued that contemporary uh theologies participation uh are really attempting to uh uh, to provide kind of a theocentric worldview, uh, but um, uh, the concept of participation is, however, subject to criticism that it have, re re relies have too heavily on part on Platonism, and therefore tends to undermine the goodness of creation. So, with regard to the one and many, uh, critics argued that the concept of participation elevates the one at the expense of many. So, the reason for this, as we have argued in the book is that there is there insufficient engagement with the Christian fundamental Christian doctrine of creation uh, in their development of the, the concept of participation. They rely too much on Platonism rather than the biblical doctrine of creation. The uh, Platonic tradition, as we have seen, is really, uh, has indeed a tendency to, to disparage materiality and plurality. But this defect has been overcome by the doctrine of creation ex nihilo which affirmed the goodness of creation in plurality. So for participation to be used in the Christian context, it needs to be transformed in the light, in the light of doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Augustine and Aquinas uh, both made significant, significant contributions uh, to this Christianization of, of the participation. For both thinkers, the ultimate foundation of participation is not Platonism, but the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. For this reason, I would argue Radical orthodoxy and Burzma should adopt a more distinctly Christian version of participation as found in Augustine, especially Aquinas, whose concept of participation as a metaphysical expression of creation finally overcomes the weaknesses of Platonism. Uh, Aquinas participating in ontology can help uh, contemporary theologians, uh, the theologians participating to find its true home. Um, then also skipping ahead. As a unique version of reality, I would argue uh, Aquinas theology of participation um, is vital for a postmodern uh, 
construction of a worldview. Uh, so uh, in the last part of this book, I, I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, participation uh, in relation to pluralism and monism. Uh, so for affirming both unity and plurality, participation, participant ontology provides a middle ground between uh, forms of monism and pluralism, therefore providing, uh, proving to be superior to alternative worldviews. First, it helps us to see the def uh, deficiencies of radical postmodern uh, pluralism or individualism. With this revolt against the all uh, totalizing, totalizing schemes and its exclusive emphasis on the difference, uh, pluralism offers no ground for unity. In uh, that system, the, the many triumphs, but the one disappears. It is a many without the one. For this reason, uh, the postmodern world, as Gunton uh, points out, is categorized, is categorized by a deep-seated fragmentation. But as um, classical theologians uh, shown us, plurality without Plurality cannot exist without unity, and absolute plurality can only lead uh, lead to uh, nihilism, which really lead, uh, lies at the heart of the crisis of modernity. But the irony is that the much vaulted uh, pluralism of modern secular cultures conceals an underlying tendency to deny plurality and individuality. Uh, this is the quote from Gunton. In contrast, while participant ontology affirms the integrity of the many, it does not reject the one, but grounds uh, polarity in unity. Uh, secondly, uh, with a with a more with a uh, transcendent source of unity, uh, participant ontology rooted in the doctrine of creation defends the irre the irreducible richness uh, richness of reality against uh, modern forms of monism, where the many is uh, really annihilated by the one. Uh, for instance. Finding the ultimate source of all things has been the motivation for philosophical and uh, scientific investiga investigations. With the uh, advance of the modern science, this quest has become uh, even more acute in modern physics. Uh, one of the Einstein's dreams was to unify all the fundamental sources, uh, forces, strong force, weak force, gravitational and electromagnetic forces into a single force, a task that continues to inspire, inspire theoretic physics. As John Barry points out, the grand ambition of modern science is to find the unified theory of everything, which offers the ultimate explanation to all reality. More recently, this vision has been explicitly voiced by Stephen Hawking and his collaborators in their book uh, called The Grand Design, New Answers to the Ultimate Questions of Life. In the book, they claim that there's no need for God because the fundamental laws of physics can explain the origin of all things. A quick glance at the title of the book, uh, uh, noting the words grand and ultimate, really reveals that, that the project is a, is a project, a, uh, is a quest for the ultimate one. But we cannot help but ask, can the one, which is a scientific theory, truly count for all of reality? I believe we can reasonably doubt that uh, one scientific, scientific law is capable of counting for all of reality, because a scientific law is not a transcendent. It is only part of the universe. So to explain all things in terms of part of the universe inevitably reduces the richness and diversity of the reality. Such scientism elevates the one at the cost of the many. Likewise, various uh, forms of reductionist physicalism, which reduces all things into matter, also uh, fails in this respect. In, in essence, reduction of the materialism is an attempt to reduce the many, all of reality, into the imminent one, which is really nothing but matter. In this system, everything, including the mind, the motion, emotion, poetry, and art, is re reduced to one principle, uh, matter. And anything that cannot be reduced to matter, for instance, God and soul, is automatically considered as non-existent uh, because uh, it assumes that only matter exists. In this framework, the many completely vanishes, and only the one, which is the matter, exists. The many is uh, eliminated by the all-devouring one, which leads to the worst type of monism. This type of word, monism is worse than scientism, uh, because the one in scientism, namely the scientific law, still contains some degrees of, of transcendence, while the matter, the one in the reductionist physicalism, is wholly in, imminent without any degree of transcendence. 
it is the complete lack of transcendence that makes the one the most suppressive. Under this one, the world becomes utterly flattened and uh, diversity is utterly destroyed, which points to a most bleak vision, a vision of reality. So in terms of one of many, um, the reduction of philicalism is arguably the worst type of medical, uh, metaphysical system. It, 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 is, it is curious in the modern world, extremes of forms, extreme forms of uh, pluralism and monism should coexist. By contrast, as we, when, as we argue in this book, uh, only, the truly, only the truly transcendent one, as we, found, as we find in Augustine's Aquinas, uh, metaphysics participation, can truly give a unity to all things, and yet maintain uh, the reality of the individual things in their intrinsic diversity and particularity. For only transcendent one, the creator of all that is, does not compete with the plurality of things. Only in such a system can unity be achieved without destroying polarity. So to solve the problem, the modern problematic of the one and many, therefore, we need to, we need to find a true transcendent one. What is the re most remarkable about the transcendent one, as we find, uh, in, especially in Aquinas' metaphysics participation, is that the one is almost also intimate, most intimate in all things. The one is not distinct, uh, distant from us, but closer to us than we are to ourselves. So in Aquinas' participant ontology, the most profound uh, vision of, of simultaneous tra transcendent imminence of the one in relation to the many is Christ, in whom God becomes perfectly unified with hum humanity. So although this might be another book, uh, it can be argued uh, that the ultimate Christian answer to the question of the one and many is really the incarnation uh, in which the ultimately transcendent one uh, became truly imminent uh, in the many. Uh, that's the end of my uh, talk. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Gabe, for that that wonderful presentation. Um, there will be time for others' questions after uh, the response and, and a chance for you to respond as well. So, Dr. Spencer, um, you now have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you again tonight for moderating. Um, we really do appreciate it. And thank you all for being here. The Picture Chair uh, is really glad to be able to support public opportunities for people to be engaged in theological discussion, especially the critical times that we live in. So we really do appreciate you being here. Okay, so without further ado, I'll get to my response. Let me begin by congratulating my colleague, Yung Wah, on a book that constitutes one of the most perceptive and necessary responses to what I consider to be one of the most excessive and misguided attempts at a new metaphysics to have been undertaken in Christian theology in recent times. To be sure, Yung Wah wants his own approach to be understood under the category of metaphysics. But that uh, question aside for now, his incisive analysis of radical orthodoxy and the related theologies, Borisma and company, put the movement and its claims to a participatory ontology in sharp and critical relief. One of the many ways I would like to demonstrate this is simply to recall what was happening in theology here at Trinity Western University as radical orthodoxy began to take the field. I remember it all too well. But let me go back a bit further first. My first encounter with radical orthodoxy was in the summer of 1995, as I was about to enter PhD studies at the University of Toronto School of Theology. At that time, I was in the process of reading John Milbank's turgid and not always well-documented theology and social theory. I distinctly remember thinking that while it was a serious and worthwhile critique of social critical thought, its proposals on the theological side going forward was hopelessly confused uh, and a, a hopelessly confused conception of the relative role that Platonism, and really what it, they mean is Neoplatonism, and what it played in the history of theology. A subsequent discussion with my erstwhile doctoral mentor, John Webster, um, confirmed my suspicion with respect to the non-suitability 
uh, as a new point of departure uh, for theology that radical orthodoxy was. It was in Webster's words, hopelessly flawed in respect to its reading of philosophical history. Thus, the book went on my shelf under the category of not to be taken seriously except in need of a good criticism of social theory, and it was promptly forgotten. I was content to leave it there until I began my first term of teaching at Acts Trinity Western Northwest Baptist Seminary in the spring term of 2002. Halfway through that term, I was introduced to Dr. Borisma, uh, then the occupant of the Geneva Chair of Theology at Trinity Western uh, Studies Religious Studies Department, or Trinity Western University's Religious Studies Department. We got along famously at once, and we still do, I should add. It was not long after we met that I began to understand that radical orthodoxy, which by then had become a force of anti-nature, so to speak, was figuring very large in Dr. Borsma's own thinking. By that time, radical orthodoxy had also attempted to enlist the likes of St. Augustine, uh, Aquinas, um, and such Catholic nouvelle theologia as Henri de Lubac, y Kungar, Antwars von Balthasar and others as guiding lights in their attempts to establish Milbank's new theological movement uh, together with Pickstock and Graham Ward. During this period, we were all very engaged theologians at Trinity Western University involved in discussion groups with one another as Protestants. Furthermore, we were also heavily engaged in Catholic Protestant dialogue with local Catholic thinkers off the record, um, so to speak. <laughs> I myself was heavily engaged in ecumenical dialogue around the theology of the Italian theologian, Luigi Giussani. What made all of this possible was, of course, the so-called postmodern critique of the rational foundations of modern secular culture and its so-called failure of knowledge. Coupled with the revolution that had taken place in hermeneutical theory after Schleiermacher, Diltai, and Gadamer, uh, the way <laughs> seemed to be opening up not just for a rereading and renewed interpretation of scripture, but also a reassessment and rereading of philosophical history. Following this rereading of philosophical history, uh, they were engaged with Hontorus von Balthasar's massive theological trilogy, so much so that the way will now seem clear for scholars like those of the radical orthodox set to reread that history such that it did not really entail the death of metaphysics after Immanuel Kant in the 19th century. So that indeed there were resources still to be available from that modern history that could be brought to bear in a revision of metaphysics precisely along the lines of participation as Jung Wa so uh, incisively sketches out for us. I remember very clearly raising many of the objections that Jung Wa has effectively raised here precisely because there existed at the heart of radical orthodoxy a complete in my opinion, misreading of the nature of Neoplatonism as it was reflected upon in medieval theology, and that he had been transmitted to some degree by Borisma in his call for a sacramental ontology. For me, I was personally disappointed, and I'm being honest here, to see such an investment in radical orthodoxy because I knew I could not go down that road since I felt uh, at that time. Uh, it was somewhat of a scholarly misadventure. To a good degree, that decision would put me on the outside of a discussion among my peers for the next 10 years and allow me little voice in the rapidly expanding approach to metaphysics of participation that now ensued. For, you see, one of the hallmarks of radical orthodoxy is that it can brook no disagreements with or corrections of its interpretation of philosophical or theological history. The rest, as they say, is indeed history. As a matter of fact, I was not alone in this strident criticism of radical orthodoxy, for some of the most renowned scholars in the field of Neoplatonic studies were equally astonished at the false premises often assumed by radical orthodoxy with respect to participatory ontology. 
Nowhere has this been made more clear than in Wayne uh, W. Hankey's uh, edited collection of essays entitled Deconstructing Radical Orthodoxy that discredits the non-scholarly and misinterpretive misappropriations of Platonism and Neoplatonism undertaken in the support of this so-called new metaphysics. It is furthermore, they say, a mistake repeated in those scholars who fail to be attentive to the excesses of radical orthodoxy in its appropriation of Neoplatonism. And as an aside here, I think that Jung Law has done an excellent job identifying the fact that this indeed was what happened. This is a book, Deconstructing Radical Orthodoxy, that was regrettably absent from your research, Jung Ra, and would have seriously bolstered your argument against radical orthodoxy and its investment in a metaphysics of participation without reference to creatio uh, ex nihilo. And that's a nice gentle uh, critique. I hope you see that as. In case there is any doubt as to Wayne Hankey's authority in all matters Neoplatonic, Augustinian, and or Thomistic, one only need to look him up online to see that he is considered, if not the foremost authority on Neoplatonism, perhaps the heir to the great Augustus H. Armstrong, uh, um, A. H. Armstrong of Neoplatonic uh, fame, um, and uh, uh, he was the natural heir of that school. He is certainly one of the most authoritative, even if he is not. Uh, the most authoritative. This book takes apart piece by piece the historical appeals to Neoplatonism foundational to radical orthodoxy's account of participation. The scholars contributing to that deconstruction of radical orthodoxy in the collection of essays uh, that he edits are themselves experts in every respect that they criticize. Here, for instance, is Hankey's conclusion with respect to its appropriation of Neoplatonism. Quote, radical orthodoxy misrepresents both the relation of Neoplatonism to the foundations of the Western turn to the subject and also the way that philosophy, theology, and religion preserve their differences, integrity, and connection in Neoplatonism. Most importantly, he says, the non-Platonism or the Neoplatonism of this theological party, he means radical orthodoxy, shares the shape of other 20th century Heideggerian retrievals. It immediately joins the transcendent and the material or sensuous, eliminating the hierarchy of intellectual forms, which was essential to the historically actual, actual systems. So jung criticism of its collapse into eminence was absolutely on the mark. Many more critiques like this abound in the book, backed up by solid textual evidence from historical sources, and I might add, properly documented, which is not something you always see in the radical orthodox scholars. In fact, Hanke and company could also have been an ally, ally to your cause, Jung Ma, had you taken time to read and analyze his excellent treatment of St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, Summa Theologia Prima Pars, titled, uh, God in himself, Aquinas' doctrine of God, as expounded in the Summa Theologiae, and that's Oxford University Press, 2000. As a criticism of this way of thinking about and invoking a metaphysically conceived theology of participation, I have little else to say than that you have done theology a great service in your criticism of this approach. But I also say that your proposal for a theology of participation linked to the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo is equally well taken as far as a metaphysical approach goes. The strategy does correct the tendency to misappropriate Neoplatonic approaches to devalue the physical and their failure to understand uh, the problem of the one and many as properly relational. Indeed, it seems to me that it is the absence of a specifically biblical doctrinal route that constitutes the failure of radical orthodoxy and subsequent sacramental ontologies of participation to get it right. Though that is less the case, I think, for Borisma than it is for radical orthodoxy. This is because it places the resolution to the problem of the one and the many, not in the fractured realm of the human ratio in coming to terms with change, but in the realm of the inner divine life in terms of a real reconciled relation, that is the appeal to doctrine. 
But I still worry that you are proposing this model of participatory ontology as a metaphysics in the service of theology. And so here comes my critical uh, aspect. For how could we ever have access to this divine relation and resolution of the problem of the one and the many within nature itself, apart from a divine revelation that gives us such a resolution? Here for me, the lacunae that could have rounded out your approach and constituted, the, uh, constituted it more of a theological foundation and revelation than a metaphysical foundation, still requiring a rationalism of sorts. They are properly ordered Christology and a directly related doctrine of the Trinity. As a matter of fact, they are intimated in your book, uh, even in the very way that you cite some of your sources and so on. Either one of these theological touchstones could have replaced creatio ex nihilo as a way of distinguishing theology of participation that more clearly avoided the methexis form of medieval metaphysics that sometimes seems to drive Aquinas' theology of participation. I don't have time here to unpack that, uh, but if you want the details of that, you can read Wayne Hankey's book um, on God in himself. Or better, the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo could have been framed in the light of these doctrines as they emerge in Augustine and Aquinas, and then it could have been employed as the total context for a participatory ontology. This would have made your book a bit longer, but not overly so, and I think it would have really strengthened what is actually still a very good argument and a very good book. Finally, I'm willing to support a participatory theology as long as it is not exclusively or even tangentially rooted in any conception of the Greek use of methexis. The Christological option, namely the incarnation, and you do cite that at the end of the book, but you do not deal with it substantially in the book, is sufficient in and of itself to define and expound a divine creaturely relation. This has been well expressed in Reformed theology for generations. As I make abundantly clear in my book, The Analogy of Faith, participation is strictly Christolo a Christological principle in which both human and divine participation representation is enfolded in the once for all historical incarnation of Jesus Christ, quite apart from nature. Under the concept of the analogy of participatory word, I describe it as follows. What then should an analogy of participatory word look like? Clearly, as per John 1, 1 to 18, and John 17, 1 following, the God-human correspondence must be grounded thoroughly in the participatory nature of the triune relation and procession, but from the perspective of Jesus Christ, the word as electing God. In these passages, there is a basis for theology of participation that is defined from the point of God's action in Jesus Christ exclusively, so that nothing in creation, either as gift or reflection of his glory, uh, predisposes this participation. In John's gospel, especially in the prologue and the farewell discourses of chapters 13 to 17, there appears to be a relationship of Jesus with his disciples, an analogy of the participatory relationship he has with the Father. This relationship of the Father and the Son is often cast in terms of a relationship determined from before time in the primal will of God. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do, says Jesus, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began, close quote, John 17, 4, 5. The glory of God in this passage, and this is the sense of the, uh, the word glory throughout John's gospel, accrues to Jesus Christ as a condition of the Father-Son relation before the cosmos could ever declare such glory. It is completely outside the primal divine election of God and humanity in Christ. The cosmos is the stage upon which, uh, that is, it is uh, completely outside, cre creation is completely outside the primal divine election of God and humanity in Christ. The cosmos is the stage upon which the eternal relation is exhibited in the decision of God to submit himself to the temporal expression of this glory. 
The glory of creation is constituted in and by this divine participation of the Father and the Son. Participation as methexis, however, grounded as it is in a Neoplatonic Aristotelian ontology of cause-effect resemblance, would direct theology away from its proper object rather than towards it, so that the cataphatic cess would turn out to be more of an anthropology than a theology. More could be said, of course, but I will leave it up to you to read further what I've said there in the analogy of faith. If we must have an ontology of participation as a basis for theology, let it be a revelation in creation, and not in the first instance, creation as revelation. Thank you very much. Well, as the response was directed to you, Dr. Gate, you're welcome to respond. And, um, and then we have a fair amount of time for further discussion. So please uh, take the time you need to respond. Sure. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, Archie, uh, for your, uh, I would say, very incisive and but also very gracious uh, response. Uh, I appreciate your uh, input and uh, some of the constructive uh, criticism. I think if I take your advice, I think we can make the, uh, the book stronger. Um, uh, so I really appreciate your uh, uh, suggestions and uh, uh, so some of these, uh, um, you know, some of these, uh, maybe we have some slight differences. But uh, I think we have a lot in common, as you said yes, in do. the beginning. Uh, we both are, we both share the kind of a critical position toward uh, radical orthodoxy and uh, some parts of uh, Hans Bersma's uh, work. Uh, even though you know Hans Bersma is a really good friend of ours, um, I, I, I do I share that uh, suspicion uh, that uh, toward uh, more or less kind of a Platonic. Uh, uh, kind of a, a version of a, a participation or even sacramental ontology. Uh, so we do share uh, this uh, a similar outlook and uh, that, uh, you know, rely on uh, too much on uh, politicism is, is, is a problem, is problematic uh, from a Christian perspective. So I thank you for, uh, uh, you know, affirming this. And uh, also I, I want to thank you for bringing up this uh, 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 Hank book. Uh, I, I, I was aware of this book, uh, Destruction, Deconstruction, radical orthodoxy, uh, as we may expect. I mean, there's a lot of criticism actually uh, yeah. <laughs> over this. Uh, there's tons of books, uh, critics, critics, and kind of deconstructing. Um, I, I can name quite a few. Um, definitely, I would uh, I would agree that uh, if I um, you know uh, refer to the book, and uh, that would definitely strengthen my my book uh, in certain ways. Um, uh, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, I think that my, my purpose of the book is not to uh, only to criticize a radical orthodoxy. It's mm -hmm. not, uh, my critique of radical orthodoxy is a really kind of entryway into the body of the book, which is really uh, to introduce the thought of Augustine and Aquinas. So I, I, I take, I didn't take, you know, uh, the, this job of criticizing uh, in a very ha heavy handed way to kind of blow that um, uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of uh, present uh, this aspect of cr uh, a critique uh, so that that would uh, uh, opens up a conversation for for my discussion of Augustine and Aquinas mm -hmm. or as an intro way into the main body. So my goal, again, is not to completely, uh, you know, uh, tear down um, uh, radical orthodoxy. Uh, so but uh, definitely, I think, uh, engage with more uh, literatures definitely would help. And uh, yeah, uh, thirdly, I, I also also wanted to uh, thank you for your suggestions about uh, you know Christ, including Christology and Trinity. Definitely, that's uh, that, that would I would firmly uh, totally agree with you. Uh, I think uh, that is definitely uh, certainly welcome. Um, I think there's a little bit of context uh, into to which uh, the re into why I I I, I didn't. Uh, spend too much time on Christology or uh, Trinity. Um, part of the reason was that when I was writing my PhD in Cambridge, uh, I had a goal of uh, getting a PhD and then teach in a, a secular university in China. So I don't want to uh, uh, sound too Christian for them. So I wanted to make it a neutral. Okay, here's a creation and philosophy. And so I don't want to get into too much of a Christology, Trinity, to explicit Christians. So that's a kind of uh, 
one of the reasons I, 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 I chose uh, to focus on the doctrine of creation uh, instead. And, um, but I, don't, I, I agree with you, um, definitely uh, bringing Christ and Trinity into the dialogue would definitely make um, you know, any kind of conversation on participating much richer and um, you know, Christocentric and uh, theological sound. Um, um, I, I, my, my, my personal take on, take on this is that um, um, I think there's, uh, there's still, uh, from my understanding, there's still kind of a certain kind of a, um, uh, not enough emphasis on, the, I think, the, the idea of credit ex nihilo, the, the, the significance and, or the importance mm -hmm. of the doctrine mm -hmm. has not been uh, fully understood or yeah. uh, in the modern uh, theological discussions. Uh, so I, this this I see as 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 an area that can be strengthened. So my book is only wanted to do, do this aspect. I, I don't want it to make it a, a fully comprehensive, say, Christian theology of participation. Uh, what I saw as a, as a, as an area of weakness, and I wanted to kind of strengthen that um, mm -hmm. by reintroducing or uh, introducing the real the, the significance of the doctrine practice ex nihilo into the dialogue. Uh, in modern Christian theology, uh, but also, I mean, uh, later on in my dialogue, uh, in my conclusion, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the significance of the doctrine of uh, Krat ex nihilo uh, into the science of, the science of theology, science of religion dialogue, and, and philosophical discussions of modern culture, and, and so on, and so such. Uh, such. So uh, that's kind of my, my, uh, my approach of why I chose um, mm -hmm. creation ex nihilo as a kind of the focus of the book. Uh, I think there are many approaches to take uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, participation or participatory ontology. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the one way I took. And I, because I, I, I saw there's a need, uh, there's a need in this area. And uh, especially in the fact that, by the fact that uh, both radical Orthodox and Hans Bursma uh, pretty much didn't really touch too much upon the doctrine of creation. And, and they rely too much, too heavily on, on, on participation. I just feel like I, I, I need to serve as a reminder that um, mm -hmm. we need to gauge more in depth, more deeply with the, with the biblical doctrines, and then you know rather than on a, on a you know yeah. uh, on itself. Uh, so that's my kind of purpose. I, I still think that uh, um, these things, you know, creation ex nihilo, Christology, Trinity, uh, they're all together. I, I think uh, they're. They're not exclusive. Uh, you know, no. you can uh, you can separate uh, Christology from uh, the doctrine of creation uh, because the, mm -hmm. the affirmation of, of Christ, the deity, uh, is uh, anchored in the fact that he's he's not the, the creature, but he's the creator. Mm -hmm. uh, so the fact that the creation ex nihilo uh, affirms the radical uh, transcendence of God is is fundamental uh, for us to uh, for us to to formulate a, a correct kind of a, a deity or a Christology. So I don't I don't see any uh, you know competition or either or uh, say by uh, constructing more Christocentric uh, uh, participation by no means uh, deny uh, maybe a more uh, doctrine creation that kind of uh, as a focus or as um, uh, as an intro way uh, into the uh, participation. So I, I I see room you know uh, uh, these these are can be extend extension uh, upon what I do you know. The, yeah. And maybe furthermore, uh, creation, uh, Christology and uh, Trinity. Um, so I think uh, also about uh, metaphysics. I know that you are you are very allergic to <laughs> any kind of the notion of metaphysics. So I think uh, uh, on this part we still have to keep our maybe differences or uh, disagreements. I, I still believe there's a room for a metaphysics uh, uh, still in theology. I don't think that. Uh, Kant's critique of uh, metaphysics is, is conclusive. Um, I think there's still place for uh, metaphysical thinking. Um, mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I think in today's uh, a lot of the philosophy departments, uh, metaphysics is very uh, well alive. And uh, so I think uh, I, I, I personally believe that uh, there's still uh, some need uh, for metaphysical uh, uh, reasoning. Um, well, I think that more maybe a more fundamental issue is the uh, is our understanding of, uh, of revelation, as you pointed toward the end of your, mm -hmm. your response. I think that is the key. Um, but I, I, as again, I think um, the difference between us or 
is a really the difference between uh, uh, the position of Thomist and and the position of uh, a bar Barthian. Uh, <laughs> I do still believe. <laughs> I do believe that uh, that uh, nature still plays some part of uh, our uh, approach to God, uh, as Quine yeah. said. You know, uh, yeah. grace uh, does not uh, abolish nature, but uh, perfects nature. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still uh, I have a, a kind of a, a story, kind of interest for. Uh, Certain kind of natural theology. I don't. I don't want it to completely go to the extreme of abolishing and completely um, denying that. Uh, I believe. Yeah. I, you know the relation between creation and revelation, as you said. Uh, so this is, I think, a bigger issue, uh, and we can still uh, live with the difference. But overall, I, I really appreciate your, uh, you know, your knowledge, uh, your, uh, you know, your theological insights and your vision, and uh, your your willingness to engage. Uh, with us, I, I think these are a great, great. Uh, I really appreciate uh, having you as as a as a theological mentor and theological colleague. Uh, I, I really I really enjoy uh, that that type kind of kind of uh, uh, okay. collaboration. Yep. Well, and I'm glad to be surrounded by uh, scholars like yourself and Michael. And uh, coming up to also next term, uh, we have uh, other uh, scholars uh, involved in presenting these, and you'll hear all about that uh, as time goes on. Jonathan Nemata, for instance, will also be doing a, a, a symposium for us next term. So I'm quite happy with your answer on, I, I had a feeling there was, I thought initially it was to make it more amenable uh, to a readership among uh, scientists and 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 particularly among those who are interested in in the relationship between science and theology, which would then have made creatio ex nihilo absolutely the connecting point. I didn't know about this other motive about teaching in China, but in that case, mm -hmm. I think the strategy was correct. So, yes, this was a, a wonderful book. Everybody should buy this book. It's important. And it's significant, makes a very, very incisive. Your writing style is so clear and yet so profound. And for a person who I don't think English was your first language of, of writing, it's crisp. It's very well done. So thank you so much. Anyway, of enough, enough of the mutual admiration society. Let's see what, what questions yeah. folks have. Well, well, speaking of uh, buying the book, the book is quite, 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 quite expensive. Uh, you know, all the lecture books are expensive, but I do have uh, like a code, a discount code. Uh, you could get thirty percent uh, if you use that code. But um... <laughs> well, I will certainly be asking for that code, Youngwa, and I also <laughs> look forward to the next book, which which follows up. I mean, you you said in your presentation that um, well, maybe this is the next book talking about the incarnation. Um, Mm -hmm. and how the transcendent one becoming totally imminent uh, mm -hmm. right uh, um, takes takes the work that you start here it seems in into a new level and I and and actually you sharing about that context in which you are writing and who you are writing for really helps me uh, see what you're doing you know to, to put it poetically the dawn of mm -hmm. creation ex nihilo to shed gradual light on the incarnation, the revelation of the Son of the Father. Mm. So this, this to me is the dawn, and we're waiting for high noon. So <laughs> that'll be the next, that'll be the next book. So we have our first question here, and for others who would like to ask questions, put them in the chat, and um, and I can uh, call on you to um, uh, give your question. And so. Uh, this one is from Mark's iPhone. Um, Mark, if you'd like me to read the question, I can. Or if you would like to ask the question yourself, you're welcome to do so. You can unmute your mic and ask uh, directly if you prefer. And if there's an awkward penetrating silence, I can read it. So, um, <laughs> so uh, this person writes, if I understand Professor Gau's position regarding the value and importance of the doctor of creation ex nihilo, is this emphasis intended to be an apophatic protest against the all too optimistic appropriation of Neoplatonism as a foundation for participation in radical orthodoxy? Yeah, this is a very, uh, very good question and a very uh, insightful. Um... That's, a, that's a, I would say just a, it's a great question. Um, 
Yeah, I think you're you're right. I think uh, there is that a sense that uh, the the doctrine of creation really emphasizes the radical transcendence of, of God um, in relation to creation. Um, the, the gap is infinite. Uh, so um, I think that uh, that is, I think, uh, as you said quite well, uh, that is um, kind of uh, the foundation for uh, more or less of a uh, adiphatic uh, tradition uh, for our for our, our, our speech of, of God uh, in relation to creation. So I think you're right. Um, my, my, in my book, uh, the reason I try to uh, emphasize uh, the significance of karate ex nihilo uh, is also because uh, this is, the doctrine of creation is fundamental to a Christian worldview and which I believe is somehow neglected uh, in modern dis uh, theological discussions. A lot of people view doctrine creation as a doctrine about a uh, created world, but I think this is a misunderstanding of that doctrine. The doctrine of creation is actually more about God than about the creation itself. It's really about the radical transcendence of God, but also in a way, in a profound sense, in a way imminent uh, to the creation. So that kind of that kind of structure uh, is really fundamental to to our, our Christian understanding of who God is and also uh, in relation to, to creation. And uh, it is, I would say it is very biblical in nature. Uh, so, uh, so part of my critique or um, the reason I use uh, Kreta Ex Nihilo as the foundation uh, in critiquing uh, the radical Orthodox approach is that I wanted them to focus more on the biblical doctrine than on purity or straightforwardly uh, Platonism. The Platon itself, uh, as such, cannot serve as the, any foundation of uh, Christian theology. We need uh, more biblical doctrines, uh, such as the doctrine of creation or Christology or a Trinity, uh, mm -hmm. as the foundations. So this is kind of my reminder for them. Uh, if you want to engage with a more uh, theology, Christian theology, we need to be uh, grounding our theology, our reasoning, our thinking more in, into the biblical, fundamental biblical doctrines. Yeah, so that's kind of a my 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 uh uh motivation yeah can i uh, can i just uh, uh make a slight explanation for this sure. question because not everybody will know what apophasis is or apophatic tradition mm -hmm. apophasis is a negative way of speaking about god that is rooted in a tradition initiated by uh, pseudo dionysius the mm -hmm. europagite uh in his mystical theology where uh, he always balanced every positive statement about God with a negative statement about God. Mm -hmm. And that was to stress that the infinite qualitative distinction between God and creation. So you're mm -hmm. right that a creatio ex nihilo would go in that direction. But that's why I said it would help to bring in as a, even, even a short chapter on the Trinitarian foundations of a doctrine of creatio ex nihilo because then the imminent mm -hmm. is immediately present without the assumption that, because it's not just apophasis, the speaking in the negative, but there's also mm -hmm. cataphasis, mm -hmm. and that is speaking in the positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so just as there are many apophatic um, names and titles that we can give the divine, there are also cataphatic or positive mm -hmm. names and titles, and that both together must form uh the uh mm -hmm. the way in which theology has to speak so. mm -hmm. i yeah I, I just want to add a little uh, further is also also is that uh actually the apophatism is not uh, foreign to uh neoplatonism itself um no it's it's rooted know, it, in that, actually. it's a part of that actual tradition as well uh so the christians and the new places kind of share a little bit of that tradition uh yeah. you know so Platonists talk a lot about you know the one as in a very negative way. You can't speak because uh, it's unspeakable. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but I think uh, you're right. I think, uh, but uh, the, the Christian emphasis on the uh, the the radical transcendence is, I think, is um, um, is more radical than uh, even uh, Platon New Platonism, because mm -hmm. we can argue that uh, the one and the emanation, uh, there is still some sort of, uh, of course, it's disputable. There's still some kind of ontic uh, connection somehow, but whereas in the Christian framework, the God and the creation, uh, there's no no Absolutely link, any sort of link. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the next question is quite practical, but I think it's also helpful is how to get discount the discount code for the book. So before before we all oh. log off, <laughs> um, okay, could sure. you please that was my question, which is great. Yeah. If yeah, you let me let me uh, go back to this one here. Okay, is. good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's so this and, is and, the yeah, so Lex uh, 30 and author 21. So um you're not 21, young boy. I <laughs> I know that for a fact. <laughs> uh yeah. so I don't know where to put this or is there any way to Sure, I, I'm uh, sure we can uh, we can send an email out to to folks. Sure, after. sure. Oh, that'll be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Kristen will look after that for us. Yeah, Thanks. and uh, yeah, there you go. Kristen said she can send an email here. And okay, thank you, great. Kristen, by the way, for the work that okay, you great. have yeah. you have put in here in running this. Uh, very seamless. So more questions, please. I mean, I have questions mm -hmm. I I could ask, but I I want to create space for others to ask questions. So please, um, please do. We'd love to we'd love to hear hear your engagements or comments or points of clarification, application. Hearing none, Michael. Oh, here we go. Good. Now uh, I, I will read this off unless uh, unless Ryan, who is who has posted this question, would like to ask. So uh, Ryan, if you would like to ask your question, it, it looks like uh, uh, a good one. So if you'd like to, if not, um, I'll, I'll if there's just silence or whatever, then I can I can read it for you. Um, all right. So so this this person writes. Um, the history of salvation in Aquinas begins with creation ex nihilo, but extends to the eschatological perfection of creation and created beings and allows for the process of eschatological perfection to be active in the interim. In basing your doctrine of a participation in creation ex nihilo, do you see a further step in extending that foundation through to the eschaton? Sorry, I think I, I was a little distracted at the beginning because there was a message sent to me. So I think I missed the, missed the uh, first two sentences. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll read that again. Sure, the thank you. Of, yeah, the history of salvation in Aquinas begins with creation ex nihilo, but extends to the eschatological perfection of creation and created beings and allows for the process of... Is that enough? Oh, yeah, I can see, the, yeah, I can see yeah. the, uh, the message now sent by Ryan. Great. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. Do you, you, you can still read for everybody else. Uh, maybe they can uh, understand what the question is. Okay. Sure. Um, and I'll just continue from where I left off and allows for the process of eschatological perfection to be active in the interim. In basing your doctrine of participation in creation ex nihilo, do you see a further step in extending that foundation through to the eschaton? Mm. Well, that's a uh, quite a complicated question, <laughs> Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, extended the perfection of various things that allows for process of perfection to be active in turn. Based on your perspective, next thing you know, do you see a further step extending that foundation through the um, to the eschaton? Okay. Just really kind of wondering, Young Wa, is sure, there sure. is there a role for the you started with creation? Yep. Is there a role for the, the beginning of creation? Is there a role for the culmination of creation to help mm. us understand what you mean by participation in a, in mm. a, in a more detailed manner? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. oh, that's a, I think that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, Thomas Quinas, I don't know, maybe he's, he's not the best person to talk about uh, this, the, the tell us. But uh, many other theologians, I mean, even uh, <laughs> Gustin talks about, you know, the idea of uh, even, uh, you know, theosis, um, the, the, the full participation, uh, the end of the participation is the participation of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. so normally, we, we understand this is a, a pretty much Eastern Orthodox tradition, but actually it's, it's really found, you know, also much of the Western uh, theological tradition as well. Uh, so, uh, 
the the the, uh, mm -hmm. the participation uh, is very much uh, uh, used understood by the the church fathers. Um, the book, uh, which is the uh, what's what's the name of the book? I forgot. Uh, Catherine Tanner wrote a, a very uh, important book uh, called Christ the Key, uh, in which he uh, she talks uh, divides uh, distinguishes between two kinds of participation. So uh, one is the weak participation. Uh, the weak participation is basically how creatures relate to God. But also she's, uh, she talks about uh, the strong participation, uh, which uh, is uh, quite dominant in many of the church fathers' uh, writing and thought. The strong participation um, uh, refers to the idea that the created nature somehow uh, will uh, receive, will participate in this divine nature that uh, it's beyond its uh, mm -hmm. its nature. So that's why it's called a, a yeah. strong participation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we we have the immort immortality, the immortal of life. Mm -hmm. uh, we 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 are somehow uh, I don't know the language is kind of sometimes uh, tricky. Uh, incorporated somehow in the trinitarian life. Uh, of course, this is also done through Christ, uh, yeah. because the cry, the unity of uh, humanity and, and God, uh, and to, by by being connected to Christ, we are kind of lifted somehow into the trinitarian life, and uh, that's the the end of our salvation. Uh, so that that is the strong sense of participation. Yeah, I can I can I only end because I, yeah, yeah. I think the ahead, answer yeah. I think the answer to Ryan's excellent question is this beatific vision. That's the consummation, really, of participation in Aquinas. Um, and so if there's an eschatological dimension to participate, participation, it would be beatific vision, because it is yeah. the, the, the final perfection. Yeah. And, that, and a participation is not just about you know, divine human agency in the order of redemption. Participation is about uh, transition or transposition or transformation into the image of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so it, I, I would want to argue with you on theosis and Augustine. I don't think it's as much there as some people say it is, but it is something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. in Aquinas, that looks like beatific vision. Mm -hmm. That is this absolutely objective realization of the knowledge of God. Yes, yes. Which is also you know, somewhat Neoplatonic in its orientation, yeah. because what the Neoplatonist wanted was an absolutely objective vision of the one. Mm -hmm. right? But it was interrupted by their participation in the many. And so the task is always to dispense with the many in order to arrive at the objective participation of the yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. And Aquinas is touched a little bit by that, because he had read... Uh, he had read the elements of theology uh, by one of the Neoplatonic scholars whose, uh, um, whose name escapes me for the moment. And this becomes influential in the way he constructs mm. his, his um, mm. uh, Summa Theologiae in the Prima Pars. So, mm. that, that would, so that's a very good question, Ryan. Yeah. I think the, other, the, the, the Protestant answer would be the Holy Spirit. And the realization of the fullness of our life in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit through our sanctification, which would be the consummate end of our participation with God. Mm -hmm. So it's glorified body that mm -hmm. uh, amounts to the end product. There, mm -hmm. would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I think you're. Uh, thank you for. Uh, yeah, um, kind of skip me. Yeah, yeah, the beautification definitely is is the kind of the uh, ultimate um, goal for um, for humanity in, in Aquinas' thought. Uh, he talks about uh, that. That's when we see God. Uh, you know, we can know God in His nature, whereas before that, uh, we only know God kind of in an in 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 indirect way. So in that sense, uh, our all our knowledge in this life is mediated and. Uh, but uh, in in the in the beatitude we see see uh, mm -hmm. God as He is, uh, so we have a knowledge, uh, essential knowledge of God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at this point, I may interject with the use of the word mediation and uh, ask, uh, as a moderator, good moderator, mm -hmm. mediator between the Thomist and the, the Bardian, uh, how might Luther's 
work play a mediatory role between creation ex nihilo and Christology as presented here. Um, because for Luther, the word of God has the power to create something, create, create everything out of nothing. And, in, and, and as an extension of that, bring what and who is dead to life. So what often is forgotten is that Luther was, in fact, an Augustinian. And so how does Luther occupy a space and maybe provides a through line here with his doctrine of the word of God? and how creation ex nihilo plays, plays a role in that. Well, um, <laughs> that's a very good observation, very uh, insightful, I would say. Uh, definitely, I think uh, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is uh, very important for Luther. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's not been very, uh, very well understood by Lutheran scholars. I, when I was doing PhD in Cambridge, uh, uh, a colleague, uh, kind of fellow student that was of mine was doing that. And he discovered that uh, in Luther's thought, uh, the idea of, of creation ex nihilo is quite fundamental. Uh, it's been kind of neglected by scholars of him. So definitely, uh, it's definitely there. And uh, uh, so your, your question is how that, how that builds a bridge between uh, ex nihilo and uh, you know, like more toward uh, crystal centric, uh, you know, that kind of uh, more toward kind of Bart's position, right? Is that, mm -hmm. yeah, that's uh, yeah, it requires more thinking or deliberation. <laughs> I really asked that with no answer in mind, like, I'm genuinely, yeah, curious. yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know that I don't know that Luther Kelvin would be more the middle ground for us because I think Kelvin mm -hmm. was much more conscious of the relative achievements uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of metaphysics in medieval theology and its meaning for his contemporary circumstances. Whereas Luther tended to be a little bit iconoclastic when it comes to his treatment of medieval theology, especially scholastic metaphysical schemes. Uh, I, I mean, he, he called this a theologiae gloriae. And what he wanted was a theologiae crucis. Mm -hmm. And that is the idea that the crucified God now constitutes the center where all of the, all of the matter, all of the, the, the problems of the one and the many, everything is realized in the death, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension session of Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's much more of a theologiae uh, crucis. Uh, Crucis, uh, in the sense that uh, he he wants to he wants to close the distance that he felt medieval theology had created between the transcendent God and the God who is with us, and he does that through an emphasis on the Word of God present in right across the Scripture. But for Luther, Word of God is not simply a matter of text on a page; it's the presence of the logos at every stage in the development of revelatory history, including metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that that's, that would be where Luther would be on this continuum. And Luther is the one who actually initiates the criticism of many forms of theology that ultimately end in the enlightenment criticism of metaphysics. So Luther might be a bad guy in the sense that he is one of the ones who might initiate the death of metaphysics of metaphysical approaches to doing theology. Right? Mm, that's right, yeah, so. thank you. Uh, so this is more of a comment, but it may it may spur a response here. Uh, so someone here by the name of Teresa says, I agree with Dr. Spencer about the importance of Trinity as I understand the doctrine with the image of God, which is Trinitarian and communal. This relational concept actually speaks to the nature of all human beings, humanity, community, humans as created for others. So individual human flourishing depends on all the others. And I presume also um, by extension creation as well. So does that spark any insight or comments from either of you? Let, let me say this first. It wasn't Jung Wah until I read your book that I, I, I came to the realization that the, the resolution in God of the problem of the one and the many is relation. And, and it was your book that taught me that, so thank you. I think that that's a significant contribution because 
even though I knew Trinitarian theology, the ultimate conception, I think, of the image of God is relational. It's not rational. Uh, and therefore, it's the foundation of the way in which God orders his creation. But it wasn't until you began to treat the problem of the one and the many in the light of creation, doctrinally, that it made sense to resolve that problem, which had been longstanding in, in the history of philosophy and never resolved, by the way. That's the problem with Neoplatonism. It never resolves the problem. It only makes God either absolutely imminent or absolutely transcendent, mm -hmm. but never relational. And uh, that's, you know, uh, so thank you for that contribution. I think you did a great job on that. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this is a this is another uh, question here too. Um, it says, thank, first off, thank you for your wonderful speeches. I want to know in particular about this book. How did you consider the thinking of readers who are interested in science and theology in the context of China? Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, the uh, toward the end, uh, the conclusion, uh, you know, definitely has implications for the science and theology dialogue. But the trouble is that you have to go through all this, uh, you know, the main body, which is uh, a little bit technical, uh, you know, in the, uh, the scholarship of Aquinas and uh, Augustine. Uh, if you uh, can uh, endure that and then get to the end, maybe uh, <laughs> you can see maybe uh, uh, some of the implications. Uh, but so I'm not sure. So, um, yeah. We have another question, question here. Uh, it says, congratulations for this new book. Eastern, Orthodox Eastern Orthodoxy holds to the notion of essence energy distinction within the framework of God's simplicity. Without making use of this conceptual distinction, do you think that for Augustine and Aquinas, the doctrine of creation as such is enough to do the work of making sufficient distinction between creator and creature while we participate in God's life? For example, theosis. Boy, there's some great questions yeah. here. Does yeah. that mean, yeah. wow, this is great. <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, Li Wei, I know, I think uh, you're a region student. I think I've seen before. Uh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, well, you know, I'm, I'm not an uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, believer, uh, so I don't think that uh, the energy essence uh, distinction is necessary uh, in, in the context of. Uh, say Augustine and Aquinas theology. Uh, it, it is already, um, I think already clear, for instance, uh, uh, for both Augustine and Aquinas, the distinction uh, between the, the ultimate distinction between the creator and the uh, creature, I mean, especially for uh, Aquinas is the divine simplicity. An idea maybe argued it was, um, but uh, it, it is there. And uh, both in, in many of the church fathers, that divine simplicity is the defining feature of, of God's transcendence. Uh, in Aquinas, uh, he talks about, uh, you know, the the interchangeability or uh, identification between being and uh, essence in God, uh, mm -hmm. whereas uh, all creatures, uh, being and uh, I mean existence and being are separate. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know it's um, so if you accept that uh, distinction, uh, so there's no problem within the frame framework of Karate ex nihilo to to have you know ultimate distinction between God and creation. Um, so so yeah, we can participate in God's life, but doesn't mean that we become God. Uh, the, the, yeah. the ultimate distinction is still there. Uh, it's not we cannot cross the boundary. I think. I think the theological ground for our participation in the one God is Jesus Christ himself. And everything we come to understand about the nature of that participation is what delivers to us the full revelation of the one God and the full revelation of our own nature. And so I have a problem I, I, I love Eastern thought, I, I appreciate it very much, but I, I find it a little too, I, I find that it wants to give too much to creation in terms of its own power for uh, relation and participation in the energy, so-called, of the universe. It, it, uh, it does not maintain the distinction. So 
in Christology, properly understood in terms of a reference to historical incarnation, we can anchor a proper understanding of the divine human relation without, without uh, running the risk of an over-identification of humanity with the divine or uh, an over-identification of the divine with humanity. I mean, again, these are balances, uh, balancing acts that we have to take, but I think that's the problem with theosis is it errs on the side of an over-identification of humanity with divinity. And for that reason, it introduces something into the absolute simplicity of God that, that cannot be the case, if indeed we're gonna uh, move from that direction. So again, even the doctrine of simplicity has to be read not in a Neoplatonic context and way, which medieval theology sometimes did, and we end up with nothing, nothingness, as a matter of fact, the nothing, as Bart would say in his Church Dogmatics. Whereas if we read the absolute simplicity of God from the Hebraic conception of the oneness of God and the being and existence of God in distinction, which, by the way, Aquinas does get right, uh, it was a very important move in Aquinas, a very important move in the history of, of, of Western theology. Then I think we have the grounds for thinking about the divine human relationality, particularly as that one God expresses himself in the revelation of Jesus Christ, which gives us now a one God in relation. So what distinguishes medieval emphasis on simplicity in the Neoplatonic way and Christian emphasis on simplicity uh, is precisely that it is an absolute simplicity yet in eternal relation in a triune sense of the word. So that's, that's uh, I think that's the, the why doctrines of the Trinity <laughs> are important in the way in which we categorize either a doctrine of creatio ex nihilo or the absolute simplicity of God. Thank you, Leroy, for that. Yeah, thank you. Question. Very helpful. That's, that's both, very uh, for both Dr. Mm -hmm. Archie and Dr. King. We have, uh, uh, we have one question here. Um, um, is, they say, uh, how, how does participation in creation affect the Christian's relation to creation? Um, and from a Christological perspective, does Matthew 25, 44 to 45 have any practical bearing? Um, I'm trying to remember what Matthew 25. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I used to, I used to have it like Actually, that, but not anymore. <laughs> I have here somewhere. I mean, I can answer. I can answer first ahead, ahead. question from my point of view. If you want, Youngwa. Yeah, go ahead, please. I, I, I think we have imminent responsibility. I mean, we are in and with God's creation from the beginning. We're made stewards of it and responsible of it, and even in the New Testament uh, description of the revelation of Jesus, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God and nothing came to be without the word. So that there is in the divinity and humanity of Jesus an inclusion of us in the purpose, the overall purpose of creation. And indeed our theology of participation properly ordered follows the humanity of Christ as the pattern in which our humanity is to be engaged with that same creation. So I think we have a huge responsibility. I don't think redemption merely uh, relates to uh, the intellect or the spiritual aspect of our being. I think it relates to the whole of creation. And that's the Hebraic concept as well. So that would be my initial so, response. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just to, just to give context, the the, the Matthew the Matthew verse is um, from is from the final judgment. So, just reading it here. Then they will also answer, saying, "Lord, when do we see you hungry, or oh, thirsty, yes. or a stranger, yeah. or naked, or sick, or in prison, mm -hmm. and did not minister to you?" Yeah. And I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. That to me reminds me of of you know. Bart's ethics and uh, the the presence of God uh, in the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So long as so long as there is relation, 
in God. And as creator, he embeds that relation in the Imago Dei. And it constitutes the form and context in which we have our being in creation. Then creation itself counts as an element and an aspect of that redemptive work. And uh, therefore has the same ontological perspicuity as the noetic individuals that, that uh, you know, enjoy the context of creation. So it is a responsibility, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think well, wait, part, part of the emphasis of the, the idea of participation is, uh, you know, God's radical imminence. Um, even though we emphasize God's transcendence, uh, God is uh, very near to uh, you know, the creed order and to us. So we do have, uh, God is not distant God. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that does have a lot of, uh, you know, implications. Yeah. Well, and that also, uh, young law, uh, you are more familiar with Augustine than I, but it reminds me of, of uh, Augustine's discussion in City of God with his uh, willingness to be surprised by God's revelation of, of what it means to be human mm. in meeting uh, people who defy our understanding of what it could mean or is to be human. Um, and I, and that that does throw me back to a part of your presentation that reminds me of the thing with Augustine is, as with a lot of the classical theologian, there's a willingness to be surprised um, and maybe enchanted by creation, a God who meets us in creation in mysterious ways that we can't fully grasp. And uh, we live in a very disenchanted world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's um that's that, that, that's really well, well said yeah i think uh, that's the the word i think uh, it's it's a good word it's an enchanted word uh you know this is the um well i mean that's kind of the argument of uh, hans berthman in, in a way uh i'm a little sympathetic in that respect uh, uh, until the you know uh the time uh people you know see people saw the world as um you know, intimate, uh, kind of uh, related to God. Now, God is not instant. God is there. God is in the thunder. God is in the storm and everything. So there's an intimate sense of God's presence in all things. Um, hmm. Whereas now we live in a kind of mechanical, mechanistic world where, well, God is like more, um, almost like a theist uh, kind of conception of God, where hmm. God is distant. God is the kind of a, um, yeah, so that 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 really uh I, I don't know i think that that kind of change uh is quite fundamental uh how we see reality and how we, we see god mm. well i think that is probably a good oh we have one more question just before i was about to close here uh which i think is actually a good one to end with so how does the notion of a suffering god in our theology play into this conversation <laughs> um, well, I, I, I mean, I've always got an answer to these, some of these questions. I, I, I think one of the confusing factors that emerged after the 19th century, especially after Hegel and Luther's Theologia Crucis, which was somewhat misunderstood by Hegel himself, was an understanding of the resolution of sin, suffering, death, hell, and the grave in the absolute death of God. And uh, it, it made for uh, a misunderstanding of God's identity with his creation and, and God's partnership with his creation. I think a properly Christological understanding of the doctrine of atonement in which there's a proper ordering of the relationship between humanity and divinity and the death of Jesus Christ. Not, not saying that God cannot identify with us and with his universe in death. I think there's a sense in which God does that. Uh, uh, you know, God comes under the threat of non-being, but by virtue of his power becomes the power over non-being such that being pours forth from death. And in that is the death of death. 
Uh, so there's an identity. There is room, lots of room, though, in classical Christian doctrines of atonement to establish that identity of God with the suffering and death of the universe. It does not mean and have to mean the absolute death of the divine, ontologically speaking. And that's where I think one of the problems that emerges in an emphasis in Neoplatonic and participatory ontology is, is it makes God so much part of the universe that it, it like Jung well says, it collapses it into an imminence, and it then does us no service, because if God's death cannot be the deliverance of us from suffering, pain, and death, but only his identity with our suffering, pain, and death, then to what end, you know, if there's no resurrection, there is no resolution of the problem of death, suffering, hell, and the grave. So that's my response. Mm. Thank you, Archie. I think, you know, uh, apart from death, there's, all, there's also this idea of, uh, I mean, the incarnation itself, I think it's God's um, taking the pain that, uh, you know, he emptied himself mm -hmm. to become a human Absolutely. being. That is the part of the suffering as well. Suffering with us, alone uh, with us. Yeah. Yeah. Can I recommend two books on this for the, per, for the questioner? First, uh, uh, Kenosis as Creation. I can't remember the author. Uh, John... Poking, uh, poking horn, mm -hmm. uh, kenosis as creation, mm -hmm. and then the second book would be God as the Mystery of the World by Eberhard Jungel. Both books oh, okay. deal so superbly with this question of the relationship mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, uh, God to mm -hmm. a suffering universe, vis a vis Jesus Christ, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, thank you for the, the great paper, the great response, the great questions and conversations that we have had. This has been uh, just very enriching. Um, and uh, so with that, we will bring this evening to a close and look forward to our next symposium. Please do keep an eye out for announcements of that. But thank you everyone for this evening. We, we really appreciate you attending and uh, stay safe. Thank you. God bless thank everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.